How would it feel to have a thriving fitness business and have the freedom to enjoy life at the fullest? Well, that is exactly what the Trainer Revenue Multiplier Show is going to give you. My name is Matthew Park. This is Amy Filer. Hey, guys. And we are here to serve. What's going on, everybody? And welcome to the Trainer Revenue Multiplier podcast. I'm joined today by one of my favorite humans. Yeah, I'm going to flatter you. I'm going to flatter the crap out of you so that you have even more to post in the mornings. Um, Aram Gregorian, how are you? I, can, am I one of the only podcast hosts who's pronounced your name correctly? You are. Well, that's because you know me and yeah. it's not, I don't, I don't know that you get a pat on the back for that just yet. Um, Aram, how did you come to the fitness industry from the finance industry? Let's start with your background. Uh, I was really good at spending money in finance and not making it. So I just realized that the finance industry was just not for me today, but I've always, I was always like that authority figure in the office of like, Oh, what's Aram eating? What's Aram doing when he goes to the gym? And like, I was yeah. getting, I was fielding those questions all day long to the extent that then like people were like, I don't know why you do this. You're probably a pretty good trainer if you want it to be. And then sure. out of necessity in 2012, when I got laid off, I went and formally got educated and like bought the NASM book and studied it for, yeah. I, I think it took me like a week to study it and I just passed the test. Um, You've yeah. been in the industry formally since 2012 and in what capacity? Cause right now you do your own coaching, but was that always the case? Were you always an entrepreneur? Well, I had, I had started taking like private training clients without a certification. Ooh, sorry. Um, like we all probably do. And then I formally started taking clients at a big box gym called Equinox in Greenwich, Connecticut in 2012. That was like my first formal jo like gym job. Um, and then I realized that like we were just like, it's just like a broken system. The model sucks. Like tra paying trainers nothing and charging clients $180 an hour for you know, for us to be doing all the client retention work, all the prospecting, all the sales, all the fulfillment. It's like, I'm getting paid $45 an hour to do your job and you're not even yeah. giving me leads. Um, so I just started realizing, I'm like, hey, okay, I'll just get as many people as I can to be loyal to me. And then as soon as they're ready, I'll, I will take them to their massive home gyms that they have, charge them 120 an hour, keep all of it. And that was my business model for the next 10 years, essentially. <laughs> Oh, wow. So you train people in their homes until 2022. Yeah, I had like a facility that I had access to that I was using during COVID, but typically I was doing in-home training. Okay. So when yeah. did you start online training? I got certified in LLC in, in 19, but I didn't actually do anything with it until like 21 when I moved from Connecticut to California and I had to go online. Because you essentially left all yeah. of your clients on the East Coast. That was a yeah. rough transition. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, but I'm so curious because you're so, I mean, you're so, you were in finance, you're great with money, you understand business and people. Why it's wouldn't the, you? But it's not the same, Jamie. Like being a monkey at an office is not understanding business. It's not being an entrepreneur. Anybody can walk in, punch the clock, do what they're told and, and, and fill out a couple of spreadsheets. I was not running a business. I was not involved in the business. I didn't know the inner workings of the business. Um, I had worked in an accounting firm prior to that where I knew just as little because I was using apps and programs to get everything done. So people don't, people that work in finance don't know finance. Let's be honest. Like okay. if they're, if they're managing people's money and they're investing and they're running an entrepreneurial shop, sure. They know a lot about finance and they know a lot about business, but most people that work in those situations don't know much about the situation they're in Yeah, because there's no like education about it. And unless you're pro proactively seeking that, which I didn't. I didn't have any clue until I started like getting down and dirty with my own business. Um, so, go ahead. Yeah. But what took you so long to hop online? Because I'm sure you were getting inquiries prior to 20. No, no. I mean, my, my Instagram page was a thirst trap page. Um, yeah. Prior to 20, 2019, I, it was me laying shirtless, dripping with sweat on the floor, trying to get attention from women. Uh -huh. It was not me serving my community in the least bit. Okay. Because I, I wasn't trying to make helpful content. I started an Instagram page because my buddy who was a photographer was like, get on Instagram. You're you're attractive and people need to see you. I said, okay. Yeah. Um, and I was making $1,000 a day as a trainer some days. So I, I didn't give a shit about trying to make more money. Right. Okay. Um, I was like, oh my God, I'm rich. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, yeah. And my expenses were low at the time. Like I was chilling. Like I was making, I made more money during COVID than I ever did in my life in yeah. finance or out of it. So I just basically said, I've always wanted to live in California. That's been my dream. I want to get out of the shitty weather. I have no reason to stay in Connecticut. I finally have some money in my pocket. That's when I moved. And that's when the necessity to go online presented itself. Gotcha. And then prior to like 2021, when I moved, I had started to shift my content over to being more thought provoking and being more helpful. And I started, that's when I was getting inquiries in 19 and 20, but I wasn't quite confident enough to fulfill the business yet. So I was kind of telling people like in passing advice and getting on phone calls for free with them. Yeah. So I think I just built up a lot of good faith. And then yeah. once I started even telling people didn't know I was a coach until like 2022, like they, they knew I was like a talking head on Instagram, Yep. but they didn't know I actually worked with individuals. They thought I was just like this, like, you know, Helpful. just disgruntled trainer yeah. who was just yelling at people all day long. Yeah. And then I just started having so many DM conversations where I was just literally giving them boatloads of free advice. They were like, holy shit, you're so helpful. What, let me pay you. And I'm like, well, I don't really have a way to even take your money yet. Yeah. And that's when like Acuity and Stripe and Squarespace and having a business model and having an offer and having multiple offers all started to evolve. You know, it does help. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have any of that stuff. And I and I still am not the best when it comes to the business side. I mean, Matt Park and I talked about this. He's like, he's like, you're too smart to be so stupid. Um, and he's right. He's a hundred, he's a hundred, and you're right. Every listen, Jill Coleman, you, everybody I've ever talked to about what I do is right. I'm just not at a place where I cared enough to grow my business yet. Like I'm kind of fine where I'm at. And right now the focus for me is getting the event to become a self-sustaining breathing organism on its own. Yeah. So yeah. once that's set, and I know I'm not going to lose money on that anymore, then I'll yeah. pour all my attention into creating a DIY, having an Ascension model, having three different offers, blah, blah, blah. Like I know all this stuff. I just don't do it. Right. Right. So I don't want to get into the, the Real Coaches Summit just yet, because that's going to be the cherry on top. But um, you mentioned disgruntled trainer, and I love I love that because a that's exactly what you are, but that's also your voice. And when did you decide that you were going to be the guy who? I mean, we have so much content in our heads from all the conversations we have daily with our clients. Whether it's like, yeah. why did Mrs. Jones not able to meal prep today? Why was she emotionally eating at night? Like we have all this power inside of our head and all this knowledge of how we help in all these individuals throughout their day. Why don't we just go and spill that all onto social media and make it productive and helpful and shareable? And that's what yeah. I did. I just started basically, I'm like, I don't, I'm not good with reels. Nobody needs to see me deadlift for the 85th time because we have already seen that video. I don't want to be the person like pointing to shit on the screen. I just hated what everybody else was doing. And I went in the opposite direction yeah. and I didn't, I didn't know about accounts like Andrew Coates or, you know, uh, Matt Carroll or any of these other people who were doing the textile stuff. And I just started doing it myself. And I made funny enough back in 2020, one of my clients in person was like a very big marketing guru in New York city. And he was like, your, your Instagram page sucks. And then yeah. Allie Gilbert, who's a friend of mine, whose event I was at last weekend said that four weeks to the beach is a fucking stupid name. Yeah. And to both of those people, I said, you know what? I have a feeling about both of these things. I think this works and I'm just going to ride it out. Wow. And, and then like two years later and 41,000 followers later, I basically told Ali, I said, I love you, but you were wrong. And yeah. to, my, to, to my old client, I said, apparently you're not that good at what you do. Uh, okay. and, and it's basically because he didn't know my audience. Like right. Instagram is a platform that's short form and quick hit. So like, I'm not going to tell you the nuances of insulin resistance in a four paragraph, in a four paragraph slide through, get bored of this shit post. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with a quick amount of information. I'll write something in the caption that's easily digestible and it's fast. And if you need more information, you have access to me 24 seven via DM. Yeah. Feel free to ask me, but otherwise, like, I'm not going to spend all this time, like trying to create this pretty content to like lure people in and then sell them 500 different things that they don't need. It's like, I'll just, I'll give you food for thought. It's already been talked about. Somebody's already invented it. There's no magic pill. Biology is not different than it was a hundred years ago. It's all the same, but we're all just fighting for like views and likes and attention. And this is the way that I do, do it my way. And it works, yeah. I guess, or until it doesn't. I, I mean, like anything. Um, so between 2012 and now, when you started till now, how have you seen, and let's talk about specifically the webinar and seminar space. 
because I feel like there's a dichotomy. Somehow there have never been more seminars, but also I feel like they're dying. And I don't I, yeah. to reconcile those. Well, I'm 39. You're over 30. Most of the people that we associate with are over 30. We value in-person communication. We value communication. We value shaking hands and looking at each other in the face when we meet. Yeah. We're not we're not hiding behind this thing all day long, wondering why we're not having friends and fun. But the newer generation, and I hate to be the old guy yelling at people through my window on my lawn, but like, let's be honest, like, get off my lawn, go do something with your life, stop fucking waiting to get rich for no reason. Yeah. But there's a lot of business coaches out there, and luckily you guys are not one of them. Like Matt is not one of those coaches. That's why I like you guys. Because he doesn't promise you these 10K, 20K, 30K months without doing any fucking back-end work or doing having any knowledge base. He's like, you have to earn it. Right. And it's, go it's going to take months and years as opposed to weeks and months, which is what other business coaches are telling these 25-year-old kids who live in mommy and daddy's basement who don't want to be coaches, but they think just because they have a nice ass and because they have a big Instagram following that they deserve to yeah. be coaches. Yeah. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to change the, the event space by making people good at the subject matter, tactical stuff to actually be a good coach and a good trainer, because then you don't have to sell anything because the sales will come to you. Like my client, I don't need to sell shit to anybody. I actually tried to talk a guy off the ledge today on a phone call. He spent 45 minutes telling me that he knew how to do everything. I'm like, so at the end of that, at the end of this, why, why are you trying to hire me? You sounds like, you know what you're doing. He said, well, I just thought I was missing something. I'm like, yeah, you don't listen and you like to talk. So instead of, if you want my help, be open-minded and have an open ear. Otherwise I don't need your money. Yeah. And he signed up in two seconds. Yeah. Um, Cause I don't, like, I don't need more business. I just want to be able to fulfill my current clientele base and give them the best possible experience. Yeah. But I think the event space is missing the, the heart of what we're trying to be, which is coaches fulfilling clients and being customer service representatives and being very good at actually troubleshooting Mrs. Jones's eating disorder problem or her, or her insulin resistance issue or her lack of training knowledge, as opposed to just selling more packages and then leaving people out to dry because you're not even fulfilling those packages that you've already sold. Sure. Sure. So what makes, because you've also attended and I'm sure you wouldn't speak at a lot of these events if they weren't up to your standard. So what makes what you're doing with the real coaches summit different? Uh, so I don't like the concept of like the VIP ticket. Okay. Uh, I don't like excluding people. Like to me, if I'm going to invite you to my party, I want you to come to my party. I don't want you to like, I don't want my party to be segregated by rooms based on access. So I don't like the idea. Like I'm going to, I'm going to strong New York this weekend. And I love Kenny, but like $750 for a fucking ticket for one meal and like an opportunity to like rub elbows with people. Like it's already right. putting people behind a red velvet rope that doesn't belong there. Interesting. And let's be honest, like Lane Norton's not a fucking celebrity. Gabrielle Lyons not a fucking celebrity. If people, if these people walk down Times Square, nobody would have any idea who they were. They're not The Rock. They're not Kate Beckinsale. They're not solving world hunger. They're teaching people how to lose fat. Like, yeah. okay. Like it's a great un honorable occupation. Don't get me wrong. I love what I do. But I think the problem is, is like people are growing in celebrity status and they're forgetting why they started in this business. Whereas for me, I want to put people on stage that are experienced, quality practitioners and educators who are going to give the people in that audience the care and the attention that they deserve because they purchased tickets. Not because they had to buy the VIP package, but because everybody belongs to, in that room. And that person on that stage sat in that chair at one point and couldn't yeah. afford it either. So for me, like, why am I going to close doors to potential people that could be in there? Also, I've been to so many events where... You don't get fed, you don't get coffee, you don't get water, you get some fucking lame gift bag. And then, you know, and then the presenter gets off stage and they're not seen for the next two days. They're gone. You can't have any access to them. There's no conversation with them. So I wanted to make something that was communal, that everybody sat at the same table, different walks of life, not sitting with the three people you came with and getting to know other people, yeah. um, having that opportunity to chat with one another. Because you never know, like somebody who could be, you know, let's say you're a part-time coach and you have this really lucrative job outside of coaching that you're afraid to leave. Well, there's probably somebody else in that room who's in the same situation yeah. as you. So how do they navigate being a part-time coach? Maybe you learn something from them because it's not always about the people that are on that stage. It's about the conversations during those meals, during the happy hours, in the hallways. And I try to keep everybody in the same place to where they don't have to like go to a different place for dinner or where are we going to breakfast or what should we get for lunch? Like leave your wallet in the room and just be present. 
Yeah, I love that. And and what I love most about the way you describe the Real Coaches Summit is that it's so congruent with who you are and your philosophy in general. If you go back 10 minutes to our conversation about what makes your Instagram different and your sales process is that all you do is give. All you do is say, here's free education. Here's free advice. Take it, leave it. Don't pay me for it. If you want, that's fine. But it sounds like the Real Coaches Summit is the same. And there's such congruence. And I love that about you. Yeah, I mean, I personally like just, I mean, this isn't a pity party. I lost 30 grand on it this year that I didn't have. That, um, you know, I, I came from Russia when I was five. My parents never had money. We never had money, period, until now. My parents live in Florida and they finally amassed a bit of a, not, I don't want to say a fortune, but to them it's a fortune. I think they might yeah. have 100, they might have 100 grand in cash finally. But that's because they, they still work and they're 75 and they don't spend money on anything. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I had to go hat in hand to the, my parents have offered me money my whole life. Like, let me give you this. Let me help you with that. They didn't pay for college. I took out loans. So I basically said, you know what? You guys have been offering me money for 30 years. I fucking need it right now. And I'm going to ask you for it. So I asked my parents to help me pay down that credit card debt from the event. Uh, I'm, I, I, my plan is to hopefully break even on it in 2024. And then hopefully at some point, if it does ever become profitable, I don't touch any of that money. It either goes back to the attendees or the presenters. Like this is never going to be a money-making enterprise for me, even though I know a lot of other people who run events do make a significant amount of money off the event. But to me, it's like, if I can make it even cheaper than it is, I would. But the problem is, is it costs $150,000 to put on because of how gourmet the food is and and the drinks and the venue. Um, but at the end of the day, like I like I like being there, seeing people's aha moments and making sure that like, you know, I was walking by everybody last year or this year. What do you need? How can I help you? Is there, is there something that you would have done better? Do you not like this presenter? Do you want to have this person come back? So to me, it's like I don't like I, I it's not for me. Like I, I don't even speak at the event. <laughs> like, <laughs> You know, and I've people are like, why don't you speak at your own event? I'm like, because it's not my event. It's an event for the people that are buying tickets. If it wasn't for those ticket purchasers, there would be no event. Right. For sure. Um, Yeah, I organize it. But like people always talk about how hard coaching is or how hard event planning is. I'm like, it's only hard because you don't put any effort into it. Like it took me 20 minutes to call Virgin Hotel last year and be like, I want to host an event at your place. What do I need to do? And within 30 yeah. minutes, I got a checklist of stuff I needed and they told me I owed them 75000 in the next six months. And I'm like, oh, I'll figure it out. And I did. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that. So speaking of 2024 and also the future, where do you see where? Yeah. Where do you project the biggest changes in the fitness industry will be? I think we're going to get, I think we're going to start seeing more like grassroots, like going back to the basics type stuff, whereas like people are going to be less involved. And like, I mean, I think for functional medicine is here to stay, but yeah. I think we're starting to realize that like without a healthy physiology, like all the hormones in the world and all the replacement in the world and all the supplements in the world aren't going to help you. So okay. I think instead of having these people that are just like deep diving into mitochondria and all this other bullshit, we're going to have people step back and be like, do we even know how to prescribe training? Do we understand progressive overload, conjugate systems? Do we understand basic nutrition adherence? Do we understand psychology whatsoever to be able to help Mrs. Jones through her eating disordered problems or her body image issues that are preventing her from being compliant? So I think hopefully as people start to realize that their their clients' problems are not as severe as they think they are and they're not broken people, they're just not able to comply to the basics, I think there will be a swing back into just tactical application practical application of nutrition training and mindset and that will start to take the fluff and the sensationalism out of it i hope that's my romantic dream um but i also think that the more young people that get into this business and the more people they follow that are assholes and that are just selling them bullshit the more they're still going to be susceptible to thinking that i need to be a gut health expert or i need to optimize their hormones whereas like you just need them to stop eating out five times a week right right it'll come back to lifestyle really that's right. that's really it i mean 99 percent of people just don't think that they just don't do what they say they're doing yeah yeah so let's also tie it back in finally to business coaching what would you say to a coach who's kind of just getting started who thinks that right off the bat, they need all of these bells and whistles. They need a marketing manager, a PR person, a virtual assistant, 
They need to attend all these seminars and become a gut health expert, specifically in women who are estrogen dominant. <laughs> so spend money on education for sure. Like, I mean, there's a lot of good certifications out there, but I think there's better like DM you and pay you for an hour of your time. Like, I think having a conversation with somebody like you who's been in this business for 20 years is going to be a much more valuable and, but come with like real questions. Be like, I know Jamie's an expert in this, this, and this. Let me ask her specifically about what I know she knows. That's what I did. I mean, I used to like DM Alan Cress. I would DM Jeff Black. I would DM everybody and be like, I'll pay you for an hour of your time. Just teach me what this means and I'll figure yeah. it out. Yeah. So instead of like purchasing every mentorship and all this other stuff, like start picking people's brains who you respect and trust and then just start doing it. Like if that means you're offering, you know, maybe your coaching offers 250 a month. Well, be like, I'll, if you pay for two or three months, I'll give you two or three months for free. Because at the end of the day, it's just your time. Yeah. Right. And if you don't have any clients, you have plenty of time. Right. So yeah. give away your time. Like if you, if you know that you're going to be trading time for money at some point anyway, if you were a personal trainer, you did that your whole life up until this point. So if you're yeah. starting to get going, grab as many opportunities and tree branches that you possibly can, because that's what it's about. It's about getting the reps in to gain some confidence that you know what you're talking about yeah. so that you can then speak with conviction about your topics that you're, that you're discussing online because if you don't, if you're not confident about what you say, how is anybody going to believe you? Like, yeah. I'm not 100 percent better than anybody else, but I know what I know, and I'm going to fucking scream it from the rooftops until my voice is hoarse and people will listen. Yeah. But I stay in my lane. I, that's why I don't go down the road of like you know understanding T3 and T4 or getting into the microbiome because that's not my field. That's not my true. field is can I get you to do the basics for long enough, and then can I tweak those basics a little bit more nuanced in your direction in your favor? after some time of general compliance. And then am I at least available for you? Because so many coaches now, you know, email check in or I have office hours and I'm going to close my doors to everybody unless it's convenient for me or I'm spending all my time at Starbucks filming how busy I am. When in reality, like I don't fucking leave my apartment. My car doesn't start for three days straight because I'm in front of a computer or I'm on my phone helping people all day long. Like if you're that busy, you don't need to talk about how busy you are. Yeah. <laughs> Can we just leave it there? Can you just stop? <laughs> Perfect. So great. Aram, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. No, but for real, uh, where can people find you? Also, why is your Instagram four weeks to the beach? Let's talk about, because there's probably something ironic there. There is. So yeah. my view of it was that like, if you're living a lifestyle of relatively good maintenance behavior, so like, let's say you're somebody who understands the basics relatively well, and you're practicing yeah. those basics 80% of the time. Well, if you had a photo shoot in four weeks or you were going on vacation in four weeks, you don't have to go and lose 30 pounds to get to the ideal body type that you want. You're already kind of there. You just have to kind of ratchet down the variables a little bit. And that's the thesis of essentially living an average behavior lifestyle that's better than it was before. And that's why you are four weeks to the beach because you're not like... 24 weeks to the beach, which is right. what most You're people, you know, most people are like, oh, I got to lose 70 pounds by October. It's like, well, it's, it's January and you're not going to lose 70 pounds in five months, nor are you going to be able to keep that 70 pounds off because you're going to go, one. fuck, you're going to go fucking crazy the second you go to Cancun. And then when you come back, it'll be a shit show because you're so disgusted with yourself that you'll just die it again. And then you'll repeat that cycle. So it's just the idea of being in perpetual maintenance. And then you know that you can dial up or down based on that. So guys, you can find Aram at the number four weeks, the number two, the beach uh, on Instagram. And then the Real Coaches Summit, where can we find that? Uh, it's realcoachessummit2023.com. I bought the domain name. I didn't know that you can link it or change it. So now it's going to always be 2023, no matter what year it is. So that'll be kind of cool. It'll be like a, a nod to its legacy of when it started, if it continues after next year. Um, it will. I shouldn't say it it's when, going, it's it going, continues. when it continues. Yeah. Um, yep. But I, I always like to plan for the worst and hope for the best because that's who I am. Uh, being an immigrant, that's the place you live is you're always hoping for you're always hoping for the best, but you're planning for the worst. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if people have questions for me, like, again, I'm not like the expert on business, but what I will be able to offer you is is just how to get going, because I think everybody's problem is analysis by paralysis. Yeah. And, or paralysis by analysis. And that's what they end up doing is they just overthink. They don't get their website going. They don't know what they're offering. They don't know what to do. 
It's like, just do the thing that you know you're good at and just get it out into the world. And somebody, once they, once that first person hits, hits, hits by, that's it. Like you're a coach, you're now an online coach and then you can build on that. But until you get that one customer first online, you don't feel like you can do it. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time and energy today. Thank you guys so much for listening. We appreciate you. If you like what you heard, make sure you rate, subscribe, share, tag us in everything. We are at Trainer Revenue Multiplier at J-A-I-M, the numbers 9-1. And until next time, have the best rest of your day. That was fantastic.